All right. So I invite everybody to close your eyes and take a nice big deep breath. Oh. I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do because he who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever he wishes, knowing he goes there with me. I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. Amen. So as we all know, it is fast approaching that wonderful time of the year called Christmas. So I usually around Christmas time try to pull out some quotes or ideas within the content of the course around the Christmas theme. And of course, I'll be doing that again today. And for those of you that are new with us and haven't been with us for over a year, we normally have a wonderful Christmas potluck party after usually this week's uh, meeting where everybody brings lots of goodies and we get an opportunity to play together and have conversations that we might not normally have the opportunity to have. But obviously that's not going to happen this year. So hopefully let us hold the, the, the concept or belief that maybe next year at this time we can have our party and we can do that. So I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but during the upcoming winter solstice, which is going to be on the 21st of this month, astrologically, Jupiter and Saturn are lined up to create an incredibly bright star of wonder. And this is called a Christmas star or the star of Bethlehem. And the last time this physically happened on planet Earth was in March 12, 26, which was obviously a very long time ago and it won't occur again until 2080. So I thought with this concept of this bright star that I would talk about the quotes and places in the course where it talked about the star. And in the glossary index from Ken Wapnick, the word star is symbol of Christ, of the light and presence of God, that always shines in us and which forgiveness reveals. And, you know, sometimes they talk about Jesus and at one point in time in his experience, he became Christed. In other words, he became connected with the Christ with him where he was no longer drawn back into living world in the worldly sense. And whether that happened in this lifetime or perhaps another lifetime, he did come to that place. And the course even describes it as he was the first one that did that. I don't know if that's absolutely accurate, but that's how it is it, spoken of in the course. Um, and that literally the, the goal, I guess you could say, of all of us is to come to that point where we become Christed where we are completely aligned with truth, where nothing of the illusion will pull us in or draw us in any longer. And I'm going to read that definition again. The star is a symbol of Christ, of the light and presence of God that always shines in us and which forgiveness reveals. So I'm going to talk about the idea that it always shines within us. And you know, I use this little chart quite frequently, and we call this the Holy Spirit, or you could say that's the light within us of which we each have, we have access to now that we are understanding the course, before we only knew of this box right here, and now we're understanding that this box is an effect of this box, but that we also have an understanding that there is a connection with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is always within us, and the ego has simply covered over this. It has not destroyed this. It has not changed this. It could never destroy or change this in any way, shape, or form. But to the degree that it's covered over by our thought system of the ego, we won't remember or have access to its awareness. And I was thinking as I was preparing for class today that if I'm 
have somebody outside of the course that asked me a question about what is the Course of Miracles, I always answer them with a one sentence answer. And that answer is always, the Course of Miracles is a course on removing the blocks to our awareness of love. So basically, this course is a course in really understanding what the ego is, which is the block. So we understand it and we understand how it got here, why it was set up, so that eventually we can undo that block and then just live in the truth of who and what we are. And that's extremely different from many other spiritualities out there because many spiritualities out there have us sit here and talk about this, but we don't really find our way to leave this so that we can reconnect with this. And the Course, though seemingly a bit brutal at times as we were talking at the beginning of the class, to have to really look at what my ego really is up to and, and you know how I try to push it down there so that I can show this beautiful facade of I'm a sweet, adorable, innocent victim. Um, and then to begin to look at that from a more detailed, very aware place is quite challenging because we not only play the part of an innocent victim so we can play out this experience with in relationship to our brother, we really believe we are an innocent victim because we don't know that we're the ones that set up the scenario that we now live and experience. So we literally believe we are an innocent victim. And even if we don't 100% believe that all the time, which probably we don't, we still hold firm to, but I'm different than you and I'm better than you in some way or some form. And Ken would often say that when we're born, we're both, we're all, all given two sheets of paper or two ledgers, I don't know, whatever. And that we put down what we do within our daily life experiences that isn't too good. But then the other one is all the things all the other people in our lives do to us or, or ways they don't treat us very well. So that when we die, we will have these two ledgers to present to God and we'll say, you know, mine isn't flawless, but compared to them, look how much better I am. And this again is part of the setup of playing the part of an innocent victim of which we don't realize that we set up the fact that we wanted to play the innocent victim and make everybody else be the perpetrator or the problem of my uh, situation. So it's a very deeply set um, thought system that's being held in this belief that I am an innocent victim. And as we begin to take out the magnifying glass and start looking at, mm, maybe I'm not so lily white and sweet as what I thought I was. And, you know, I think I'll, I'll just throw out, you know, driving, <laughs> you know, how many times either somebody tries to run you off the road and some people would be giving them the finger or screaming out the window or whatever it may be. Um, and that's just one very small example of ways that that internal part of me who is defending myself is trying to uh, withhold and, and withstand my 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 beingness as a body because if somebody pulls pulls into me they could kill me um so my natural response oftentimes is a form of attack that really isn't particularly pretty so what the course is actually asking us to do is to become more aware of how many times how many ways that that little flare up inside comes to the surface not to judge it, but simply become aware of, oh, so that's what the Course means by, you know, kill or be killed. Look how quickly I'm there to, to defend myself or attack somebody. Or if somebody just looks at you funny, it doesn't have to be some major significant thing in the world. Somebody looks at you funny and all of a sudden, that, you know, we're brought to that, that, that place of there's something wrong with me, I'm not good enough you know, I don't look the right way, whatever it may be in any form that could present itself is just showing us how much we, we don't believe we are aligned with that love of God. Despite the fact, it says the symbol of Christ 
the star is the symbol of Christ, of the light and presence of God that always shines in us. But to the degree that I did, we identify with our ego, we're not going to remember that that star or that symbol of Christ is within me. I will be, um, I guess you could say, miffed into believing and accepting that the ego is my true reality, despite the fact that underneath, the Holy Spirit is waiting for us to reconnect. All right. So then he says, in which forgiveness reveals. So I wanted to discuss a little bit about what the word forgiveness means because, oh, yes, the course, it's so cool and unique. <laughs> uh, no words really mean the same thing as they do on the outside when we're talking about the course. But from the perspective of the course, forgiveness doesn't mean, you know, Rose did me wrong and you know, I'm going to show her what a good holy Course of Miracles student I am and I'm going to forgive her. While the whole time internally, I'm holding and I'm savoring that horrible thing that she, I think she did, which she may not have even done, but I'm harboring because it's within my mind. And I will carry that around with me, even though my mouth might say, oh, I'm, you know, I forgive you, Rose. But the Course is really asking us to use our brother for a totally different function. We literally set this all up once we chose for the ego and we projected our, into our brother all our guilt, sin, and fear so that we could play the part of an innocent victim. And every time the perpetrator shows up, I internally I feel very justified to attack them because how dare they attack my innocence. But now we use the awareness of my brother or a situation or experience that comes up as an awareness that, oh, look, something could trigger me that could show me that I do not connect with peace, which means I have to be aligned with the ego and I wanna find out how to get over here instead of continue to play over here. So now we take that same scenario that the ego set up, but we use it for a totally different purpose. And may I say for people that are new on, the, fairly new on the call, this is not some magical thing that you hear this and it's like, oh yeah, every time somebody bothers me, I'm just gonna go directly to this and I'm gonna ask for healing. We are so deeply seated in this thought system. It may take many, 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 many years before we can automatically respond from, oh, that's right, I'm not really upset because of what this person says, as it says in workbook lesson five. I'm upset because I've chosen against the love of God. And when I'm ready, I can realign with what truth is. And then he will show me what that represents. But that is a practice that will most likely for most of us take some time before that becomes a very automatic classroom. So basically forgiveness is our, we take our special function that shifts perception of another as an enemy or special hate or a savior idol special love. So literally it's going to change my relationship with the way I see my brother, whether it's a special love relationship or whether it's a special hate relationship. Because instead of using it as I'm an innocent victim justified to attack you because you attacked me, we then use this character as a reminder that they represent that I have, uh, I have aligned with the ego instead of the Holy Spirit. So again, we use the same classroom, but for a totally, completely different purpose. So when we're able to do that, we then will begin to see our brother as our, sa as our savior, and we will see our brother as a friend instead of a kill or be killed enemy. And we will literally remove the projections we put on our brother. And we will then see our brother through the light of love instead of through the projection of guilt, sin, and fear. And as it speaks of in the, the glossary index, we will then be, it will then be an expression of the miracle of vision of Christ. And the course talks about the idea of sight and vision. When we look through the eyes of the ego, we're looking through the, the sight. When we look through the eyes of the Holy Spirit or God, we are looking through the vision of Christ. Totally different experience 
though the same scenario can be played out at, in your world. So it's not necessarily that, you know, after you work on the course for X amount of time, that you're suddenly going to live in this kumbaya kind of world and everything's going to be beautiful. But you will begin to practice using the course in the midst of the conflict and the chaos that takes place in all of our lives. But slowly you will remember to use it for a different purpose that will eventually bring you to an aspect of healing. So he goes on to say, forgiveness recognizes that what we thought was done to us, we did to ourselves. And again, to new people, I know that's a new concept, but be very well assured that some of us have been studying the course for probably 40 some years, and it's still not a concept that is easily lived. We might intellectually understand it more and more, and we may practice it more and more, but our natural response usually is a wave just hit me and I just fell down and it's somebody else's fault, not mine. Of which, you know, hopefully we get a little quicker at regrouping forces and then use this through the purpose that the Holy Spirit is asking us to do as a reminder that this is what the choice was that has brought whatever form of chaos or lack of peace that represent, is represented in the world. And be very aware Oftentimes this comes through another person, but it can be your car, your toaster, or a circumstance, or a situation, the coronavirus. It doesn't matter what it is. If my peace is lost, it's never about the scenario that appears to have brought the lack of peace. Because if we were over here, the same thing could happen, but my peace would not be disrupted. It is only when we're over here that we know that if my peace is, can be disrupted, it has to mean I'm aligned with the ego. And now we know there's another thing I can do to help walk me out of this very seemingly solid belief system that we've lived in since the Big Bang. So then he goes on, I'm gonna reread that part again. For only we can deprive ourselves of the peace of God, therefore we forgive others for what they have not done to us not for what they did. So in other words, we, we, we literally totally dismantle the belief system that has been set up to be uh, the camouflage that kept us very stuck in this square and kept us in a place where we could never literally come to an awareness of connection and love because we were always playing in this arena where the answer does not lie. I'm going to pause there for a moment and ask if anybody has anything they want to speak about there because there was a lot of juicy material. And of course, if not, we'll just move on. All right, I'm here in silence. All right, <clears throat> so the sign of Christmas is a star, a light in darkness. See it not outside yourself but shining in the heaven within and accept it as the sign the time of Christ has come. So the, again, the sign of Christmas is a star, a light in darkness. And I was thinking as I was preparing for class, we know you can walk into a dark room and flick on the switch. And suddenly that room is light instead of dark. Well, I think one of the challenges we probably have is that we don't know we're in the darkness. This is so, um, we're, we're so comfortable, we're so used to living in the darkness, we don't even know we're in the darkness unless some uh, situation in our life, you know, surfaces and we're drowning a little bit, then it kind of catches our attention. But for the most part, we don't even know we're living in an experience of darkness. It's, it's almost like a fish that's been swimming in dirty water all its life. And then somebody comes along and says, you know, why don't you come over in this pond? This pond has got nice clean water. And the fish is going, well, what are you talking about? What's the problem? I've lived in this all my life. So they, we don't even know what, you know, how, I guess you could say how bad we have it until we start really looking and digging and paying attention more that we eventually become aware that Something's askew here. This is really not, not what it's cooked up to be. So Jesus is saying, 
see it not outside yourself. In other words, he's saying, don't, don't be thinking your answer lies on the outside of, some, of the next shiny coin that you can find in your life. And yes, it's true. Some of the things in our world are fun and they're exciting and whatever, but none of them will ever take us to that connection within that Jesus, the Holy Spirit are offering us. They will just appease us momentarily. And we all know that oftentimes, let's say if you're on drugs, you have the drug, you have a wonderful high, and then the next time you have to have a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more because it's not sustaining. And this is literally a, an opportunity to learn to come to that place where we have that sustained place of connection and love. All right, so again, see it not outside yourself, but shining in the heaven within. And accept it as the sign the time of Christ has come. And at the beginning of the class, I mentioned the idea that this, the star is a symbol of Christ and that Jesus came to a point where he was Christed. In other words, he connected fully and wholly with the Holy Spirit. And literally, Jesus is inviting each and every one of us to follow the path that he set out so that we too can connect with that place of Christedness within us where we're always being led by that light instead of by the darkness that we find ourselves in now. <clears throat> All right, so let's move on. So the time of Christ is really the holy instant. And so what is the holy instant? And I'm going to read that for you real quick and this again usually when I talk about uh, reading the definitions it's from this book called the glossary index for a course of miracles written by Ken Wapnick and he takes a lot of the concepts that the course offers and gives definition to it so the holy instant is the interval of time in which we choose forgiveness instead of guilt the miracle instead of grievance the Holy Spirit instead of the ego. It is the expression of our little willingness to live in the present, which opens into eternity rather than holding on to the past that keeps us in hell. So basically the holy instant is a moment, literally, and it's not defined here, but it's defined in other places, a moment out of time and space where you drop your connection with the ego and you have that little willingness to open to what truth is or what that looks like, which then shifts the perception which, which, which you look through to see the same scenario that is occurring in your life. And um, let's see if I wanna say anything else besides that. And again, it takes your grievances and shifts them. It takes your fears and shifts them. And this is going to be a process of when you recognize you're not at peace in the world of, wait a minute, now I can do something different. I can look at this and understand that even just when you're up here observing yourself in relationship to the world and you're the observer instead of the character, that's really connecting with that holy instant as well because you're either identified here or you're identified here. And when you're identified here, you're no longer attached to the body. And even if that's only a moment's time that you do that, it is making a shift that's taking you more, taking you to a place of being more and more invested here and less and less invested here. And literally each time we do that, when we come back, we are not the same as what we left. Now that doesn't mean when you come back, the argument or the irritation or the upset could still be going. In fact, it could even get uglier. But the part of your mind that made that shift of choosing to stay here or observing rather than being the character is healing. And eventually this side will become the more automatic side, just like this is the absolute uh, automatic side where we're always uh, responding out of. And just before the class, I had this thought of what we're literally working, looking at 
is what was set into motion. And think about if you order something from the Penny's catalog, okay? We ordered it and then it shows up on our doorstep. Okay, literally this is what's kind of happening. So whatever you see in your world is what was ordered via the ego. All right, so this is coming to the door. No, that's a no brainer. It's gonna come because we ordered it. So now the only real recourse we have is in the next moment, what am I gonna order now? And what I mean by that is how I respond to the moment of whenever the package arrives. And again, with the ego, the package is always gonna be an ego investment package. But what am I gonna do with it? Am I going to fall into responding further into the ego, or am I gonna drop it and align with the Holy Spirit? And the value of that is, when I begin to do that more and more frequently, the packages that are going to be delivered to my door are going to reflect love instead of project guilt, sin, and fear. So it's you know really to our advantage to start to respond from that place as soon as we can remember to do so. But it's also important not to feel guilty or attack yourself if your intent is to come from that place and you just spewed out of your mouth something that you know was totally not loving stop again and have the willingness to observe yourself spewing which is exactly what the ego always does don't be surprised this is not if you're identified with the ego it's not going to spew love it's not love but if you can observe it without judging it or condemning it then you're literally over here and you're not reordering more from the catalog of the ego anybody have any comments about that quite group today <laughs> well i think that everybody's sleeping ah uh, <laughs> do a dance or something right Bob? <laughs> all right so again this is our i guess you could say our way out is the holy instant what am i going to do in this instant what am i going to do in this instant what am i going to do in this instant and you know initially the healing process is going to be to begin to understand this and then as we continue to progress to begin to practice it more and more and then not judge yourself if you haven't done it perfectly and i've always been quite amazed that this has been called a course in miracles and we know if let's say you're in math class at school and you make a mistake the teacher will probably circle it and put an x next to it or whatever they do these days and she's not doing that to reprimand you. She's doing that to help you understand that one was not correct. And let's go back and work on that one so that we can get it correct. Well, literally, that's what's happening. If I don't do it perfectly, it's going to give me another opportunity to practice. And to simply look at that as a, um, another opportunity for practice to take me to that place where I automatically respond out of this. And we all know two and two is four. We don't have to stop and think about that anymore. At one point in time in our childhood, we had to concentrate on that to get that programming into our mind. Well, the same thing's gonna occur with the practice of the course. We're not gonna initially do it very speedily, or at least that's been my experience, I will say, because we are so um, identified and addicted to the ego our natural response is not to drop the ego <clears throat> and line up with the Holy Spirit. Our natural response is to run with the ego until it, I run out of breath, literally. But now we're at least starting to get an idea of where the problem lies and where the solution lies so that eventually we will automatically respond completely from the place of the Holy Spirit instead of from the ego. But we have to start with where we are and where we are literally is mind melding with the ego so don't take it so personally when you automatically respond out of the ego because we've been programmed to do that before you even showed up as the little character called you on planet earth all right so um the time of christ is really the holy instant in which there is no sacrifice 
not getting too far. I'm going to stop right there again. So <clears throat> we know many religious practices in the world have a lot to do with practice. You need to do this. You need to sacrifice that. Don't eat meat on Friday. What, you know, whatever. Give up things for Lent, all that kind of stuff. And I'm not knocking any of those rituals. And if that's something that works for you, by all means, continue to do it. But from the perspective of the Course, literally, when you no longer want this and you want this, it's no longer a sacrifice. Okay? So this is not asking us to turn over here if you really still are very stuck over here. That little willingness is a moment in time where you really come to that place where, nope, I don't want to be in control. I want you to show me what truth is because I don't know how to figure it out myself. But at that moment, you literally are not sacrificing because of that choice. You are coming to that choice because that's enough of that. <coughs> I can't figure it out myself. And we come to that place of awareness, much like Bill and Helen, <coughs> at that moment where they were going into their next meeting, and they were always argumentative, horrible meetings. And one of them said to the other, there's got to be another way. Because they knew they wanted something different than continuing, continuing to repeat the same situation over and over and over. And we all will come to those moments where I don't want to repeat the same argument or the same scenario over and over. I really do want to seek an answer that goes beyond my ability to respond and figure this out. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so the time of Christ is really the holy instant in which there is no sacrifice, in which we choose against the ego and choose Jesus as our teacher. Again, two catalog or two pages on the catalog, I guess you could say. You can order the ego or you can order the Holy Spirit. Whichever one you order is going to then start presenting itself into your life. But understand, <clears throat> when we chose the ego initially, we literally mind melded with the ego, totally forgot that this existed, and then we closed off not just this, we eventually closed off the thought that, that, um, that produced this. And we were here thinking this is the only recourse we had within the world to deal with anything in the world. But now we're starting to understand this is simply an effect of the thought against the love of God. And below that is the understanding that we are truly still that light and love that we always were. But we have to kind of take these steps to get back to where we really are, but we have forgotten where we were. <clears throat> All right, a particular component of that choice is recognizing that there is nothing outside of us that can affect us in any way. Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but that's not my experience. My experience is, you know, I woke up this morning, everything was fine. Somebody said something, somebody did something. I turned on the TV and this happened. Whatever it may be, big or small, and the Course is very uh, adamant about the idea that there's no hierarchy in illusions. doesn't matter if somebody bombed your house or if you cracked your fingernail. If you've lost your peace, you're not at peace. And we really want to begin to hone in from that level of the significance of the size of the disruption is not significant with the concept of what the Course is talking about. You're either at peace or you're not at peace. And if you're not at peace, we now have an option to do something different when we're ready. <clears throat> so again, I'm going to read that line. And a particular component of that choice is recognizing that there is nothing outside of us that can affect us in any way. Uh, you know, how are you guys feeling with that? You know, does that make sense? I bet it does. <laughs> you know? Because again, we are so programmed to believe the problem lies on the outside. And I was fine until this occurred. But in truth, if you were really fine, you'd be over here, and if that occurred, you would still be fine. If you 
are thinking you were fine and then something occurred and it appears to disrupt your peace, it was because you're aligned with the mind that is against peace. And this is not uh, Jesus making us, trying to make us feel bad because that's where we're coming from. It is literally an awareness to help us understand if that's what's happening, what can we do about it now to bring us to that place of peace? instead of making us feel even worse than what we normally feel. <clears throat> All right. All right, so um, nothing outside of us can affect us in any way, that the light of Christmas is not something external, that the birth of Jesus into the world should not be seen as anything that has to do with form or the birth of a body, but basically the appearance of this great symbol of heaven's love that is in our mind. And understand that just like we see these two characters that come from this mind, um, and one of them we dump our guilt, sin, and fear in so we could play the part of an innocent victim, when we're aligned with the Holy Spirit, which is still part of form at this time, we're still going to see more than one character outside, a me and a something else. But now we're going to see that character as the same instead of different. And what he's saying about this is, you know, Jesus comes as a symbol, not as a body, not as a character, not as an individual. He comes as a, a symbol of that light that is within us that can then get reflected out when we're aligned with that light. And again, as I said a few minutes ago, um, you know, he's gone ahead and done that and now he's helping us to lead the way to find our way to connect with that love on a significant um, way so that that becomes our natural part of being all right it is not something that appears and disappears it is always there and again with this chart um, this is always a constant this is what appears and disappears or partially disappears and then you know, appears again this is the constant so it says um it is not something that appears and disappears it's always there the light and love is always within you it's just that we've covered it over by this very heavy dark thick cloud of belief that you know in one of the workbook lessons i always love it it says you know the ego is it's literally just a cloud and you could just drop a coin and it would fall to the ground because there's nothing really solid in it. But to the degree that we are invested in the solidity of this thought system, that's what's gonna block us from the awareness of that light that is always waiting for us to connect. Now, the season of Christmas offers us the opportunity of remembering that the time of Christ is always right now. And the Course speaks in numerous places about the idea, if we're living in the past or we're living in the future, we cannot access that now. And that that now is literally the only place where we can connect with what truth is. And that means I have to relinquish my belief and acceptance of what I think is happening, it's right or real. And I have to have that little willingness to let him show me or replace that belief system with his answer, which is always coming from a place of love. So again, Christmas is the season that offers us the opportunity of remembering that the time of Christ is always right now. And you know, think about all the many ways as you walk through your week of how we take a scenario or a situation that's occurring to us in our life now, and it's always filtered through a memory from the past or a fear of the future or a concern that happened before, and if this happens, then it's gonna happen again. Or we know that uh, famous uh, quote or thought of, you know, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop because this can't possibly remain this way forever. Something bad is going to come and take the place of whatever that was. 
because that's how the mindset of the ego is so heavily programmed to see and experience the light or the world through. And we're really being shown, being asked, uh, the, we're, we're being offered, I guess that's probably a better way to put it, being offered a different way of being, living, and experiencing that will undo the entire thought system of the ego. And again, if you, I mean, we, we all live in Cleveland here, or most of us anyways, and we know how some days you would swear it was night all day long, even though intellectually we all know that the light is always, or the sun is still there. It's just covered over with some massively heavy clouds. Well, literally our process is number one, recognizing that the clouds that we're invested in are what is keeping us from knowing that light within and that as we practice the course, we will begin to lift the heaviness of those clouds so that eventually we will know only the light. But we have to start with where we are, which is this belief in this heaviness of the ego. And again, part of the, a great part of the course is the, you know, the exploration, the identification with what is the ego. Why is it so thick and heavy and why does it seem to have so much control over us despite the fact that, you know, Jesus speaks in the Course that we are love and light and joy and peace. Why is it that when I revert back to that place of my ego, that, that, that ugly spew comes coming out instead of pure love and light? I mean, I, I haven't said this for a long time, but I think it's really a very simple concept of if, if I have a lemon and I squeeze the lemon, what's going to come out is lemon, lemon water or lemon juice. Uh, and if you take a person and you squeeze it, what's going to come out? Well, if you're aligned with the ego, what's going to come out is you know, some spew of the ego. But if you squeeze that same person who's totally aligned with the Holy Spirit, the only thing that could possibly ever come out love. And so if anything can bring forth a response that is something other than love from you, it represents that you're aligned with this instead of this. But not to take that information and make it make you feel worse. And I know we have a tendency, I know I do anyways, a tendency to, to revert back to that. But simply to use it as a realization of, oh, I must be aligned with the ego. And I now can do something where before I thought I was stuck here. I thought I had no recourse to find another way or to, you know, other than attack my brother. So again, we're being shown, given, offered the opportunity of ordering from the other page of the catalog. You can tell our brothers are not sure about the ego. You're not sure about the ego? Is that what you said, Pat? Yeah, I was going to ask you about my sister, but Bob said he told you already. Yeah, you want to run I was confused because, you know, she's a very, uh, she's not a soft spoke, but she's a normal woman, you know, and, yeah. and um, she, she became this uh, crazy person, and um, it, it was for, from the morphine drip is what caused it. But, uh, you know, punching everybody and swearing and carrying on. Now, she will not remember this when she, when the morphine is all absorbed. Mm -hmm. But um, what, does the ego take, take took over when she isn't even aware of it? Well, yeah, I guess you could say <laughs> the ego's always there, but we usually have a, a shell or a protection where we, um, what's, a, what's the word I'm looking, um, kind of control ourselves so nobody sees that part of us. And we don't even see it. We're, we're not, you know, we play the very uh, good part of being a sweet little innocent victim. But what happens when all those barriers are gone is that real me can kind of puke out, I guess you could say. And we all have that within us. And you know, we were talking before the, the class of 
how if we're really honest and we begin to observe ourselves in situations, especially when you're not very happy with what's going on in the world, you know, we, we would more than happily like, you know, maybe not physically kill somebody, but get rid of them some way. So I don't have to deal with them. And that's really, you know, really telling of what the ego is really about. And it's really not particularly pretty. So do you think she got rid of a lot of her anger? this way you know i'm not sure i would say she got rid of her anger but i think you know the classroom might have been just for you so you could become aware of what's really hidden within us that doesn't come out very often you know i, I don't know you know yeah she doesn't didn't well i don't know i don't live with her but right, exactly uh, exactly uh, but you know there isn't any i mean i used to say you know we we all have those moments where you know the spew is black spew is going all over the living room and yeah. if you guys don't have some of that going on yeah you know, give me a call and tell me how you do it because i don't believe you <laughs> literally you know we, we have the semblance of being nice and calm and peaceful and joyful and all, you know, all that kind of stuff but yeah. you know when when the doors are closed and something comes up the the real you i guess you could say comes forth really quickly uh -huh. uh, yeah, oh, Pat wasn't here uh, when we had the conversation. Right, right, right. And when I told Pat that this is this is her real sister, that's who she really is. That she kind of poo pooed it, and it really didn't want to hear it. You know? Yeah. Well, but I mean, the bottom line is we played the part of an innocent victim all our lives. Who wants to look at it in us or even in somebody else? And yet, I have a question. Yes. I, to me, Bob says that's the real sister because that come out. She was on morphine. Correct. Morphine does something to you. Correct. That doesn't mean that that's her real person. Right. That is what the effect of the morphine is doing. It, it interferes with your brain. Okay, but the point being is if we were aligned in truth, well, she's in the ego. I recognize that. Correct. Right. But, but she took morphine, and morphine is doing something to her body. Well, but it's exposing. That's not exposing her real self. Right. It's it, it's uh, uh, oh, it's showing uh, that she cannot really hide this uh, anymore, and that's her real self coming out. The real no, self. No, that's part of the morphine. No, it's part of the ego. Yes, that's how the ego is. And and it's, you know what? And and the the true practice of the course is not what's happening to her. It's what is my reaction to what is happening to her. Yeah. You know what? What am I? What's happening in my mind? Am I judging this? Because if I'm judging it, then I'm in ego. Right. No. So that's where I go. What's happening to her is not my business. My business is what's happening in me. Right, and, but, but I think that the bottom line is kind of what Don and, and Bob are talking about. It's like even when people <clears throat> are on drugs or in alcohol or whatever, you know, the, the, the kind of outer protective shell of who we express as starts to come forth in a different way and does literally, um, I guess you could say allows <laughs> more an awareness of what's really going on within us. And yes, it is it's stimulated by the drug or whatever, but that couldn't have stim been stimulated had it not already been within. And as Rose was saying, you know, our job is not so much to worry about what they were going through, but to really see how that affects us. And, you know, oftentimes, we don't like to see something like that in somebody else. We don't like to see somebody else die because, or, or even die because that represents, that could happen to me. That's really me that's being shown on that screen. And I'm not real comfortable at looking at that right now. And you know, again, it's, it's almost like you're, you're not gonna lift up the whole veil initially, but as we keep looking more deeply we're more willing to look at that's really a reflection of inner fears within myself well, right and what i was looking at is that is that i did not see i did not see this i heard about it and that and, and then i was wondering 
where does this come from? And, and this is a, and this is what I came up with. Where you know, where it comes from, and not saying it's in her and not in me. It's right. in everybody who's in the ego. Yeah. And and you know, a lot of times I, I I will hear people say, "Well, you know, I I, I was really I kind of lost it in my ego." I'm sorry about that. I saw that. Um, you know, I, I really lost it, but you know, I have this really bad cold, and my resistance is down. Well, <laughs> you see, the, the thing is, that couldn't come out if I really was in a place of total peace, and that's the thing I think we have to. Oops. Wait a second. Can you see me? I kind of blocked out there for a moment on my computer. Yeah, you're okay. I'm there. Okay, good. Let me. Marianne. Yes. Hey, it's Dawn. It, it, interesting um, experience. I was on call um, in its 24 seven, you know, for seven days. Okay. And um, I was very sleep deprived. Okay. Right. So I couldn't, uh, I got to one day where um, some part of me came out that is usually masked. <laughs> and it just made me think of you know, how, how hard it is because we're all filtering who we are because of the ego. And yet at that moment in my lack of sleep and my deprivation, it just came out. So. Right. Beautiful. You know, and, and this is not like we're supposed to just, you know, tear off all of our inhibitions or whatever, you know, continue to, to try to be a good person in the world. But when those come up, First of all, don't deny that that's coming from my ego and just simply look at it and go, oh, wow, that's how my, what my ego is really up to in there. And, and just become more and more acutely aware of the underlyingness of the ego and all the games that can be played. And, and I think we slowly become aware of, oh, I'm not such a lily white innocent victim that I thought I was. And I think that dismantles that image of ourselves and then we have a little bit more compassion for our brother. It seems to automatically occur that way. But, yeah. I'm also real fascinated this week. I've been thinking about the fact that, um, and, and it's in the Bible too, is whatever you see in another person is sometimes a reflection of, of what's in you. And so I was thinking about maybe a, a narcissistic personality, for example, and I thought, oh, well, if I'm seeing that and that's bothering me, that must be part of me <laughs> in the ego, um, in the ego trance that I'm in. So I, I just appreciate the course for bringing that um, awareness little by little. Um, well, I have this saying, Don, that if I walked up to you and told you you had purple hair and you were six feet tall, you would look at me like I was a little strange. But let, and I have no, I've never even physically seen you, so this is not against you. But if you'd gotten on the scale this morning, you gained five pounds, and I said, Well, Don, you're looking like you put on a few pounds. Immediately, you would be, you know, have a tendency towards attacking me <coughs> physically because how dare you tell me I'm fat, even though internally you're already feeling that way. So if anything can disturb us, it's already in our consciousness on some very deep hidden way. So, you know, even if you can't specifically connect the dots to whatever somebody triggered you, <coughs> you know that if we're, if we have had the capacity to lose our peace, it's because we're aligned with the ego. And it becomes cut and dry, basically. I want to share something. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, that's A chamam. You, you, you know that, Marianne. I, okay, but I don't know who else. Okay. What, this was like decades ago, but my first started, not when I first started off, but I was on a heavy duty spiritual journey. We used to have like 48 hour workshops where we would get together at somebody's house, do heavy <clears throat> manual labor for 48 hours, no sleep, no food. And the purpose for doing, and we all willingly signed up and paid for this, okay? <laughs> in order to get in touch with that shit that was coming up that you were talking about when you have no defenses. Yep. And it's amazing that, you know, the stuff that came up in people, but so I was just remembering that when you 
right? when you said right. that. Yeah. Interesting times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, literally, we are being asked to take out your <laughs> magnifying glass and walk along your days with your magnifying glass and wait for those moments when the puke comes up. <laughs> it gets right to <laughs> Because that's really what we want to examine. We really want to look at because that's just representing, you know, I'm not that lily white little character that I've made myself out to be. I may appear to be a little nicer than the other guy, but I'm not really too nice either. Because if I have a thought of, even for a split second, of, whoa, I want to get you, uh, I'm not a loving character. And that's very helpful information. And, and, you know, we spoke before, I believe before the class, that you know, our initial examination of some of the stuff we're talking about here is not very comforting to the ego because I don't want to recognize that I'm not this sweet little innocent victim. And it's pretty hard initially to really be that hardcore. But as we begin to do it, we become aware, oh my gosh, look, I didn't get hit by lightning. Um, things have literally cleared out and I'm not so uh, uh, stuck on the ego as I was before. And then we begin to trust this process and practice it more diligently. But it's, it's yeah. at the beginning. <laughs> For me, also, the more I see my ego with clearer eyes, the more compassion I have for others who might be um, what I might think is a difficult personality, for example. Oh, um, indeed. But, but because I am, I am the same. And to love your neighbor as yourself is, that's yes. why. Yes. But yeah. it's not a false, I love you. It's a, I love you based on, um, you know, I, I sometimes give the example if I have a picture window and it's just caked on with dirt and gross and climb and whatever, but I start to scratch a little bit of a corner away and, and the light comes through, you know, I am more aware now because I've scratched off that dirt so that the light can come through. It's not a, I'm talking about the darkness, but I'm going to tell you what light is because I know everything, which I really don't. It's just an automatic response from that where it's a, it's a it's a bigger awareness of what is available. And it's a really a beautiful expression. And it's you know, what, what I live for actually in doing the course, because it's, it's not a pretend experience. It really is an expression of love because I've scratched off some of that dirt that's keeping me from seeing my brother more clearly. And literally we've made our brother the bad guy so we can look like the good guy. That is not nice guys. I don't care what else you do in the whole planet. That's not a nice setup. There, there used to be a girl who came on Saturday. She's not, she lives out of town now. Um, who, that when I would say that, she really had a hard time digesting that. But that's really what this is saying. I made my brother the bad guy so I could appear to be the good girl to hide the fact that I identified with the belief of separation instead of connecting with love. That's not nice. We created both. Well, we created both, but we made the other guy bad so we could look like we're good. Yeah. But we're just as guilty for both parts of it as we are because we're not aligned with what we are. And it will keep us stuck. And when we can release our brother, we're literally releasing ourselves because when we come over here, we're, we're aligned in sameness, not in duality any longer. And connecting with love. <clears throat> but that, again for where we're sitting, because we're so addicted to all the aspects of the illusion and the ego, and we think this is it, it's hard to drop some of these things. We're so addicted to them, and, and not even consciously addicted to them. It's, it's like we, we popped into this world with this body, with this programming, and it's all we've ever known our entire life. And then we all lived in little square boxes and different streets, and we went by the rules and regulations or we turned totally against them and we're still stuck in either one of those thought system and we run our lives that way. Totally unconnected with what our true reality is. Alrighty, so the appearance of this great symbol of heaven's love that is in our mind, oh, wait a minute, the, the appearance of this great symbol of heaven's love is in our mind. So again, it's not in the world, though we, uh, you know, we all grasp and cling and chase and whatever, something on the outside to fill us up to make us feel a little bit better. 
which is something we will probably all continue to do because that's the setup of the ego. But as we begin to become less infatuated, I'm going to say, of the world, we will become less dependent on thinking that something on the outside is going to fill that hole within and we'll be more motivated to connect from the internal uh, connection rather than the external. It is not something that appears and disappears. It is always there. And again, the sun in Cleveland is always there, even though some days it looks like this. <laughs> but we all know intellectually that dang sun is up there somewhere. <laughs> all right, so the season of Christmas offers us the opportunity of remembering that the time of Christ is always right now. And you know, if we could get nothing else other than the fact that no matter what happens in the world, no matter how awful or terrible or seemingly significant it is, in this moment, I can drop it and ask to see it more clearly through his vision instead of my sight. And I, I know that's not our natural flow most of the time, but as we keep practicing, it will become much more a natural expression. The presence of the Holy Spirit in our minds has never disappeared. And you know, I find that very comforting, no matter how much I push it away, it's never going, I can never get rid of it and it will never be changed by anything that occurs within the illusion. It is this light shining in darkness that is the season of, the, that is this season is the remembrance of. So if we, do our best rather even in the midst of the chaotic stuff we do in preparation from Chris, for Christmas. You know, when you're standing in line and the lines are too long, instead of whining and moaning about all the things that they should have done to make it better for you, you know, can that be a moment where you can connect with that shining light within and be asking, show me that I am that light. Show me that my brother is that light. So quite literally any moment can be turned and shifted and changed to a moment of healing instead of complaining and being upset or falling into the illusion. As we approach this season with all the stuff of, of hoopla and commercialism, we can, we can nonetheless still use the Christmas symbol as a reminder to ourselves that despite what goes on in our personal world or in the world at large, this light is always shining. And again, you know, this is not about tomorrow. I've, I'm in the course now and tomorrow I'm going to wake up and my whole life is going to be fine. It's not the way this works. In fact, oftentimes, I'm sorry to say, after the honeymoon, it oftentimes appears to get worse. I don't know if it necessarily got worse or that we're more consciously aware of what's going on and it appears that way. But either way, this is not about the stuff isn't going to happen. It's about how do I respond to when the stuff happens? Do I respond from my right mind or do I continue to respond from the ego mind? And I want you to get clear to the best of your ability that when you respond to what's going on in the world, you're either ordering from this catalog or this catalog by the response that you give. If you respond to the ego, you're literally saying to the universe, bring me some more ego shit, excuse the expression. When you align with the Holy Spirit, you're saying, I want to know what truth and love is instead of what I'm used to over here. But at the same time, don't feel guilty if that's your intent, but your body goes and does what it normally does, because that's just the addiction that's continuing to operate you. But the moment... So bring it back and say, wait a minute, I don't want to stay here. I want to align with truth. Yes, go ahead, Andrea. So it's not, it's not what appears. It's what we're willing to cooperate with Correct. that we get. We, we can't fight what's, what is, what yeah. appears to be an issue. We have to be willing. We, we drop that and, and ask it, and, and be willing to, to cooperate or try to cooperate or look for where, there is cooperation for peace. Correct, correct. And you know, I always give the example of you know, the stories about Jesus, the course. It's written by Jesus, so you know, that's the, the information we've been given. And we could say his last days were not what we would call kumbaya, they were pretty rough days. And yet 
what his purpose in that demonstration was to show was even in the midst of a horrific, horrible, terrible experience, his response was to align himself with the right mind instead of the ego mind. So that no matter what was done or seemingly done to his body, he was totally at peace in the midst of whatever was going on on the outside. He also explains you know, that was the last useless, um, I can't remember the exact word, steps to the, to the cross or something along this line. And we don't have to go through that particular classroom, but use the classroom of your daily life experiences. When stuff comes up, are you going to come from a chaotic, insane mind? Or are you going to still your mind to the best of your ability and ask to be shown how to see through his eyes instead of through your eyes? or just drop it, you know, even, don't even try to, you know, calculate or figure it out, just drop it and ask it to be um, filled in by his answer instead of what, what our eyes have been trained to see and, and how our emotions are been trained to respond. And, and well, it's really kind of, I guess what's energizing is when something's going on, just remembering and thinking to myself, what in the world is this? And being kind of being told, so why do you want to think about that? You, you don't know. <laughs> You're asking, what in the world is this? Do you really want to? Because there's no way to understand that because I kind of reached, that was like the end of my rope. You know, what, um, what in the world do I do with, with groundhogs under my house? What in the world is that for? And then just go, okay, I don't know. That's crazy. It's just nuts. I'm going to let you know, if there's another power here, hey, you know, I'm ready. Yes, and, and it literally is to our advantage <laughs> when we get to that moment where we literally, you know, throw up our arms and go, I don't know. I don't know how to fix this. I don't know what the problem is. I don't know what the solution is. I'm done. What do you got for me, dude? Those are the moments that are just so healing when we can really come to those. And, you know, there's a lot of, I'm going to call them false asking for healings where we think we are coming to that point. But then there comes those moments where it's just like, I'm, I'm done. There's nothing left in here that can figure this out. I'm asking for your help now. And it's coming from a complete, absolute dismissal of thinking I know to allow that to come forth. What a sure choice to choose against. It's always our choice to choose again, and the answer is always available when we do that. Um, and, and I, you know, think about this from the perspective, you can take as long as you want to do this. There's no reprimanding, there's no, um, you know, the whip is not following us around, but the effects of the belief that you are adhering to will continue to play out in your world. And as we become weary, of the effects of the ego, we are more inclined to want to choose differently. In the in the paper or in the, one of the um, issues of the um, lighthouse, I guess that, that's the publication that can right. Yes, had um, he talks about how when things, uh, if you feel you've been harmed or anyway, you've never had any you've never gotten all the things due to you in your life that um that that's an ego thought and that your the remedy is to give a blessing and that's what you'll receive as well which i thought was really very wonderful thought that just you know you you may feel bitter about this didn't happen and that didn't happen but if you if you give a blessing then you get the blessing as well. And that's really what you're looking for. You're not, you're not looking for, I mean, you may be looking for uh, someone to, um, you know, fill up this spot that you feel is, has been vacated by, you know, life, but that if you give a blessing, then you, you get one too. So, so you, then, then you get what you want or what's going to really be something that you can you can have what is the blessing i thought that was really wonderful to read that today well that's very beautiful as well as it's a good indication when we're over here praying for literally the relinquish or 
the continuation of the character called me, I'm praying for stuff that's going to make the hero of the dream happier. Okay? The answer over here is about connecting with who you really are in truth. So when we're sitting over here praying with an intent or a um, belief that we know how something's supposed to look or how it's supposed to turn out, we're, we're literally praying from a place that we can't access what his answer is. And his answer may not be in line with this, but it will be an answer that is much more connecting and coming from a place of true love instead of just the fixing of my dream here. And um, I think it's real important to, to realize that you know, we, we all, I'm sure, have known someone, let's say, that smokes and they're hacking their, their lungs out and they say, but I really should quit smoking. And this is not a judgment on anybody that smokes or ever smoked. I'm just using this as an example because I think it, it's very apparent. If, if, if they're saying, oh, I really should stop smoking, and then two minutes later they light up we know how strong that addiction is but well, we don't get that the addiction that we have to this character called me and this thought system it is so heavily invested in fact it's been been continuing since the big bang and so when we you know pop over here for a moment we're going to pop back over here and this is going to grab a hold of us again because this is what we have literally ordered and said yes this is what i want Keep bringing some more, bring some more, bring some more, bring some more. And then we go, oh, let me see what this is going to be. But this is going to still override us for uh, some time. Until eventually, this will be the overriding one, and we will com completely respond only from this side. And that's the process of doing this. But again, observe how addicted to the responses that we have in this world. They're always evolved around protecting the little hero called me. That's a no-brainer within the context of the setup of the illusion of the ego. And it's all about will or be killed, separation, I'm going to get mine. So when you were talking, Andrea, about when you, we give a blessing, and a blessing to me is to relinquish you know, our investment in what we think we know, we're literally offering not just that blessing to ourselves, but we're offering that blessing to our brother because we've dropped our programming that my brother's got to be a problem so that I could be the innocent victim. It's like we've erased the game we've, we've been playing. Now, I, I used to talk about the idea of if I'm a little kid and I go to a garage sale and I buy a game and there's no directions, and being you know, enterprising little children, you take it home and you get a couple buddies together and you start playing the game and you make up your own rules. You know, this is all I got to work with. Well, someday somebody might walk in and say, well, that's not how you play that game. What's wrong with you? And you wouldn't be too excited about changing the rules of the game because you've been playing it this way for a long time. And this is, you're addicted to this, even though the right way to do it is you know, the, the, the right direction. Well, we've been playing the game this way for eons and eons and eons of time. And now we're being reintroduced to the real way to play the game. And it's like foreign to us, majorly, 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 majorly foreign to us. And so we very slowly have those moments where, okay, I've had enough. Show me what this is. And then eventually this will grow more. This will decrease more because literally this is a live because of the investment in it. And when we start to invest in this, in that instant, we are not investing in this. And so eventually, if we continue to invest in this, this will outgrow this, and this will then take over. But that's gonna be a process because we've done. This is the one that's been running the show since the Big Bang. And instead of being upset with ourselves when we can't, um, hold firm to what the teachings are of the course as consistently as we would like to, we should really just embrace the beauty and the amazement that we now have a, an awareness that we have another choice, even if we can't choose it all the time. That wasn't available to us before because we were literally stuck in the I'm an innocent victim of circumstances beyond my control game. No way out there. 
because I literally live and breathe to have a perpetrator so I could play the part of an innocent victim. And on some level, I'm waiting for the dude to show up so I have a good excuse to attack and then blame them for my reason to attack. And then I feel guilty because I attack because good people don't attack. And all it does is recycle the same old guilt that's been sitting in the pot for a really, 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 really long time. And so, you know, we're, we're up for a task here, guys, but the possibility is available to us where at least, you know, at least in the past, it was never even available to us. All righty, where did we leave off? Oh, yes, did somebody else? Have? Yeah, go ahead. Hey. Yeah, it's so interesting. So something to Could listen. you speak just a little louder because we it's a little hard oh, to hear. Is that better? Yes. Okay. okay. You know, yeah, we're we we used to operate in a certain way and it's almost like you know, we're having to turn everything around and upside down, right? We have it all upside mm -hmm. down and backwards. And that's very disconcerting or, you know, it, and listening, even listening to something as an equal, we always want to do. We always think it's something we can do. And what I'm finding, what, what, what's becoming clear to me is this thing. You know, I hear it, and conceptually it makes sense. Right. You know, it's not about doing anything. But it's, and even that, it's just hard to let that go. And just to see that looking, I'm just, you know, developing, developing vision to just look at what's coming up because you know you ain't got to do nothing it's going to come up you know it shit happens yep and there i am and then looking at it just like when you were saying um the chart it's interesting I, well, the other day um speaking when i was speaking to you about um looking at the relationship with my daughter-in-law and uh, her inconsistency in returning a call or you know giving me what is it i don't know accolades i don't know love whatever and seeing today when you put up a child that's it we're constantly special relationship looking for a consistency looking for that light in somebody in something and being able to see that in that moment to ask now what, what do I, when i ask what do i want what do i expect from her I want her to be consistent. I want her to love me. I want her to do this. I'm looking for her to, I'm looking for her to, of uh, that love of God. It's, and it's impossible to uh, expect that out of a human. Yes. And how tell you don't, that? <laughs> you know, I don't see how crazy I am. Amen. And I have to look at that. And, it, and it's very painful to sit and look at how messed up we are yes ma'am you got it <laughs> well also it, it it's something about we we're looking for acknowledgement from someone but not from god we're looking for acknowledgement that our being is uh important to someone and i think it's just because we're used to that like somebody's talking about the way people are customarily uh, you give somebody something and they acknowledge it. Um, and in a place where, um, you know, I guess I, I feel like that we're trying to get away from that. We're trying to go where um, spirit leads us instead. And we don't really need that. We just, it's just something we're used to. And, and I have a, um, a similar, um, I feel a situation with my daughter-in-law who um, has never been unkind, but I just, I get no acknowledgement. And I really have to look at myself. Who, what do I need acknowledgement from her for? I'm okay. What's the matter with me? That's kind of what it, <laughs> and you know, then that's becomes a question. You know, what, what do I need? What, what we, what uh, I think Marianne spoke about today is the hole inside, you know? I've turned away from love. I've turned away from, you know, um, the light. And I'm a needy, desperate, you know, thing here. <laughs> you know, I'm very needy. And I think that I can get, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just, 
like this very hungry, very hungry, uh, mm -hmm. going to hungry ghost, just looking for something to feed me to make me feel okay. And I'm needy. And 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 one of the things in the course I'm, they, they talk about is is um, coming from a place where I have no needs and seeing that I have no needs. Well, I think you know. Let let's just start with the idea that you want I, I want something from that person um that's going to yeah that's going to to acknowledge me um when in a way they don't need anything from me so what's my problem like it's it's so interesting how and you know i've sat with it a lot you know of well um and yet when i've been in her presence she's not unkind or weird or anything she just doesn't um doesn't come across you know as acknowledging or you know saying thank you or things that i grew up customarily saying um but that doesn't you know i i really have asked the holy spirit to help me detach from that um my need but i have to acknowledge that it's there first and say okay this is what i'm thinking and I've had conversations, you know, my sister's a psychologist and we've talked about the difference in people and how, um, you know, you, you're, you're supposed to be a part of the family, but, but you can't hit people over the head with that. And that's kind of what I, I want my organizational um, knowledge of the way things should be to, to stand up first. And um, I, I don't really want that because I, I know I, I had freedom and I did what I wanted to do. So, but, you know, I think that's what it's a customary way of uh, interacting with someone you call your daughter-in-law. Well, that's too bad for me. You know, that's the bullshit I want to talk about. Somebody, she's a, a woman who is with my son and however that is, she's not mine. Uh, or somehow I want her to be mine, just the way I talk about her. Um, so that's been, a, you know, it, it's been a couple of years of, you know, well, um, and, and, and finally, like it's, it's dissipated. Like, you know, you, you, you still bring it up as something that bothers you in a way in your mind. And then you go, well, you know, it's not going to change because I want it to. And because I want something here. It's only going to change because I asked the Holy Spirit what to do and to just and, and then it's taken away the sting a lot of the sting of just you know so um and i still you know try continue to ask my son you know how is she what she, you know what is she doing today and you know um it's often looked at as interference well what do you care what she's doing she's busy i mean it, it's interesting so um, it, it feels like a really big lesson too, cause I have one son and he, he's, you know, that's what, what our, our life is, <laughs> except I guess the Holy Spirit's giving me more to my life outside of just those two people, which that's not fair to the Holy Spirit because I, um, you know, am on my own as you know one of one of the holy spirit's people not my son's mother necessarily or whoever i am it's 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 a it's a journey but it 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 really started to work to my advantage to not be and, so upset and what i look at too is this and what the course says is this is the purpose of the world seek and do not find you know, so I, mm -hmm. I'm aware that I'm looking for love, appreciation, and approval from outside of myself. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not always aware of that, but when I become aware of that, I notice it. Oh, yeah, I'm looking again where I'm not going to find what I, because when I do get that, it's so fleeting. It doesn't change how, you know, I think of myself. It doesn't change anything. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing that changes is when I notice I'm looking for that outside of me, Jesus help me. Yeah, well, but your uh, goal should be to make yourself a complete person so that you don't need other people. Yeah. But that, that's, 
Because the course says there's nobody out there. <laughs> yes, exactly. But I don't do that. I ask for help. That's all I do. I notice Most and people. I ask for help. Yep. And I think, you know, what Andrea was talking about, what Tashara was talking about, is we have that lack within us because we've chosen against what love is. We don't, we don't experience love here. So we're looking within the context of the world, your daughter-in-law, your son-in-law, your child, your whatever, you know, my boss, you know, make me feel like I'm okay. Well, first of all, they can't because they don't have it to give to you because they're just as sick as you are, no offense, because that's the way it's set up. But we're constantly looking outside for something to fill me up so that I will feel you know, make it through the next day, basically. And like Rose said, even if they do give it to you, it's either so fleeting, or they didn't say it quite the right way, or you know, they didn't write the note the right way, or whatever it is, it's never gonna fully fill me up because it can't fill me up because it's coming from the false world. And, you know, Tashara mentioned the idea, we think we need to do something on the outside. Well, what we need to do is go with, um, within to connect with that truth and then that hole is filled, and then we'll see that other person through a more whole and loving way because we're not looking at them as limited because we're looking through the lens of limitedness. And you know, then they're free to be who they are. And if you think about it, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we were all brought up in these little boxes and little box square boxes and on different streets. Well, my rules are different than your rules and how I was brought up. So I'm going to do it my way. You're going to do it your way. And then you're going to say, well, why don't you do it my way? We have chosen a world of duality. And in duality, there is no place we can connect because duality is opposites. So what the answer is, is go within, connect with the oneness, and then the rest of it will take care of itself. And if you see the, and if you have the love in yourself, you'll see the love in the other people. Absolutely it's correct. Care, yes. Take care yes. of everything. Yes. You, the only reason you're looking for this love is because you don't see it in yourself. Correct. And, and I would also say, you know, you're going to continue to want to find it on the outside. But be gentle with yourself and, and try to be, uh, you know, you're going to try to get it from there. But then try to work on connecting with that love within. And then that will begin to outshine your need to be fixed by the world all the time. And, and, you know, that it's, it's like putting a Band-Aid on something instead of healing and putting, a, 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 what's that called, a scab. <laughs> you know, it's a natural. Yeah. Yeah. I, think a, I think a big part of, of the relationship has been that I'm afraid I did something wrong. It's just interesting how it's not, it, it, again, it still has to do with the world. You know, what did I do wrong? Why doesn't she... Uh, do that say this or say that what is she and then so now and then they aren't used to plague me and bother me but now I feel like it doesn't mean that I can't it doesn't mean that I need to to let all that go that that I have to stop being nice or stop like it kind of like it's like it's kind of like it's it's uh, uh baiting me to like well what you know now well what can you do about that you know that's what that's this way and now what can you do about that and more like it's like um i'm feeling stronger at this point that i need to just keep doing what i do and to feel and to ask to, to sh ask to be shown what is the loving thing and so it's not um you know, instead of turning me against that person, it's helping me to um, look, turn, continue to turn toward that person. So, so it, it has, it kind of has its own, you know, with the Holy Spirit, it has its own remedy of just staying steady and being myself. And, and that's what I'm not doing when I'm all worked up. Right. Uh, that I don't think that most people want to be around a needy person that's true yeah that, and that and that's kind of i mean I, that's part of the answer is i there's nothing happening that's really um happening to me right 
but you know, that, that's not really happening. It's just what I'm thinking, what should be the way it, you know, should be a customary way that people interact. And um, that's, there's no such thing. Actually. Right. Be careful for those beliefs of investment in what somebody else should do so you can be okay. And, and we all do it again, so don't feel bad when you find yourself doing that. But as you mentioned, Andrea, you, you've been stepping back and you've been sitting with it and you've been trying to examine it from different facets and different ways of seeing it, which open the door to other possibilities coming forth, which is cool. I mean, the opposite of that is lashing out at everybody. Yeah. You know, who do you talk to? Well, I did, I did talk to my sister, but not, you know, with an attempt to understand. And, you know, um, exactly. that's all we, we talked about it, but, you know, we didn't um, say. And, and I remember growing up in a household where, you know, a certain uh, aunt uh, did things differently. And my mother would go on and on and on about, you know, well, that was a stupid thing. Why did they do that? Or, you know, she, my mother would ask this aunt, uh, the aunt would come over once in a while and she'd say, would you, what would you like to drink? And my aunt would say, um, iced tea. And my mother would make, she didn't have instant iced tea. She would go in the kitchen and she would make this, uh, you know, hot water and then she put it in the, with the sugar and she just went through, she would be in the kitchen for a half an hour making this iced tea for my aunt. And then when the aunt would leave, she'd say the nerve of her asking for iced tea. <laughs> She would be so mad. And I guess it's, you know, maybe that's a legacy as well of, you know, like, well, you know, what's, um, but people mm -hmm. shouldn't be the way they are. They should mold themselves more to be like you are and to be more, less demanding and, you know, whatever. It's just, it's just, that's been my upbringing to uh, look at people being obviously quite different and you know, getting mad about it and, and sticking with that story for, you know, and years later, my mother would say, uh, remember that aunt. And I finally, I would say, I, you know, I don't really want to talk about that right now, but it was just so interesting to me. That's kind of how, you know, we've got this. Right. And, and I, I love, and, and I would suggest all of us, look at incidences in our lives because your mother was taught to be a nice person <clears throat> and ask your guests what they want. And then when the guests answered, she wasn't really happy about the answer. And it's, we, we, we make these setups in our lives in very, 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 very subtle ways of, well, I'm going to be the good hostess, but I can't believe she asked me to make that tea. That's hard for me to make. It, it's crazy. It's just craziness. I want to share this this thing that I put sure. uh, wrote a, that was seems appropriate and good for me to hear again <laughs> for me y'all um, and um, he he talks about he talks about uh, the reason the ego made the body as uh, Rose was sharing the, the reason the ego made the body with needs physical psychological and emotional is so that they would not be met and then so then we go searching right then he he says that. Uh, we go searching for the special love, and uh, when the needs are not filled, you know, all hell breaks loose, uh, <laughs> which keeps the ego system going, right? Speed. And he says, but once you have needs, you have expectations. The expectation, you know, that you'll meet my needs, blah, blah, blah. So, and I'll do all kinds of things. Um, and he says that the right minded expectation is to have the expectation that people are rotten. People are cruel, unkind, thoughtless, cannibalistic, and mean. And you can look at that in others and in yourself and accept it. That's how you get from the wrong mind to the right mind. Because all that cruelty and madness and meanness, all that unkindness is a veil that hides what's in our right mind, which you showed us earlier. Um, right. Yeah. You know, the, it, it's all hiding something. So if I'm seeing that she's she's not calling me. She's thoughtless. I'm thoughtless. I ain't calling me. I, what am I calling on? I'm calling on ego. Yep. You know, she's taking something. I'm taking. I'm walking away from something. I I've, I've walked away from something. You know, looking at that, I that I really appreciate the Byron Katie book for those turnarounds because, again, looking 
what do you think you're looking at? It ain't looking out, you know. If I continue to think that it's something out there that I'm, I'm looking at that I need to fix, I'm in trouble. Yep. Okay. Oh, and if you think about the first lines here, where after it really happened, was guilt, sin, and fear, kill or be killed. You know, the description you wrote, kill or be killed. It's, it's innate in our thought system. Not as Mary Ann, because Mary Ann's is the puppet playing it out, and so is everybody else in the world. But the thought system that's operating the puppet when it's aligned with the ego is a puppet that's operated by guilt, sin, and fear, kill or be killed. Not a nice thought system, the opposite of love thought system. And we're being asked to really take out that magnifying glass and observe how frequently that shows up. And take the little irritations of your daily life experiences and filter them through this so that you have an awareness of what's running the show, basically. And it ain't love, baby. <laughs> it ain't love. <laughs> All right, so this light, oh, and I did want to make the comment that I basically started the, the class by reading, the sign of Christmas is a star, a light in darkness. See it not outside yourself, but shining in the heaven within, and accept it as the sign the time of Christ has come. When we can take the focus off the world, off the character, the hero of the dream, and bring that to where the real light lies, then you're going to start to see shifts and changes in your world life experiences. Because you're, you're then asking the light to direct your path instead of the darkness to direct your path. So this light is always shining and there is nothing and this is perhaps the most important aspect of the symbolizing symbolism. Absolutely nothing in the world that can take this light away from us except our own decision, our own fear to see that there is a power greater than heaven. And what is that power greater than heaven? Me. I want to be an individual, special and separate. So as long as those are intact, I don't want to re, um, re, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Reintegrate back into what I am as oneness because I can't be an individual, special, and different if I'm in oneness. So, as long as that's the overriding internal thought system that's operating the show, that's what I'm going to pay the price of in that process. Um, and that there is a power greater than love because when we chose to separate from the love of God on an internal basis, we believed we actually had more power than God because we could pull off the separation. In truth, it really isn't a power beyond or more powerful than God because it's a nothing. It's just a set up experience that appears to be a something and that we are that power. Well, we're not that power. We're simply an effect of a choice that is bringing us something that hopefully we're starting to catch is not to our benefit any longer. This is the source of the belief in separation. This is the belief in guilt, but all this is part of the ego's trickery. Okay, this is one big magic trick going on here, guys. And we know in a magic trick, someone can appear to cut somebody in half. But if you go behind the scenes and you watch how the, the magician did that, he tricked us into believing it was true. Well, the ego part of us has tricked us in believe, into believing that this experience, our whole life, the character called me as the hero, is fact. So that means this couldn't possibly even exist. This is, the, this is solid. This is the rules, man. But as long as we stay intact with that, we can't access where the true answer is. The truth of the matter is that this light remains always and can never be extinguished by any of our faulty decisions, which to me is really very reaffirming that nothing that I've messed up in my whole life or lifetimes perhaps before that can ever affect what truth is. But I will continue to reap the effects of this choice as long as this thought system is intact. And it will continue to run the show, not because of its power, not because of anything other than we have invested the power to make the machine of the ego continue to run. 
And as long as that's intact, we're literally saying to the universe, I don't want this, let this continue to run. Until that moment comes where we have the little willingness to drop this and choose again. Well, well Marianne? Yeah. Yeah, from what I understand, now, no, I, I don't know if this is in the ego world or, or if it's in the Holy Spirit's world, but, but the closest thing that we, that we know to, to love is to accept the person for who they are and to do not judge and, and do not judge them. Yep. Yep. And literally, when we are aligned with the mind of the Holy Spirit, we couldn't possibly judge them. We would accept them completely as they are because we would be looking through the lens of love. And the only thing we could see is love, okay. not because of what they do or don't do. So then I'd be on the other side of the church. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I mean, I can sit on this side and say, oh, I'm going to accept you unconditionally. But highly likely the underlying belief system of the ego would still be running the show. It's really the relinquishment of this to align with that. So we are told repeatedly in the course that our life here is a dream. And a dream is not reality. This light of Christmas shining in our minds is the light beyond the dream, is the love that is beyond all the fear, all the guilt, and the hate and the pain and the suffering and the death that so characterize our world. And you heard the word death. Even death is part of the illusion. In eternity, oneness, death does not exist. It's hard for us to drop the concept of death even, even though we say we hate it. That's how sick this thought system is, guys. It's a thought system of belief in something in total opposition to our true reality, which unfortunately we just happen to be extremely addicted to. And we still harbor fear of returning back to oneness because we are so, so enmeshed in this thought system. So this season, let us remind ourselves that no matter what goes on in our personal life, we can still find this love, this peace, and this hope of Christmas. But again, it remains there always for our taking, but it always requires for us to drop our investment in the ego just for that moment and call on the connection with the Holy Spirit without bringing any of the trash with us. You know, and understand, when you're asking to, to be over here, you're not just asking you to be over here, you're asking your brother to come with you. Because your brother's either in the separated state in your um, experience of the ego, or your brother's coming over here. You're, you're like a, um, one of those conjoined tw twins. You can't go anywhere without each other. <laughs> you're taking them with you, I guess you could say. And, <clears throat> We can't think, oh, well, I'm the holy one. I'm going to go over here and show God how loving I am. And that idiot can stay here and do whatever he has to do. Not going to work, dudes. Not going to work. I have to relinquish my entire investment in believing that my brother is doing something to disrupt my peace. I have to wash my hands of that whole concept and, and say, I don't know. You show me how I can love my brother because, damn, the way I'm looking at it over here, that ain't happening. Okay. I can't of myself figure that out, but I can relinquish my attachment to thinking I know and allow that answer to come forth. Did you have something, Rose? Yeah. Um, this is, um, I, I want to share something that I found incredibly helpful. Um, and it's from a course group on Facebook. And this is a dream that somebody had, a night dream. Um, I dreamt I was writing the dialogue of a horror movie. I was directing and producing. Line by line, I could see the paper and my writing of assigned lines in front of me. It was a real classic horror movie, very realistic, a zombie movie where everybody that was bitten and chewed up eventually died. Except me, of course, being the director. So I... The director, the producer, became so immersed in it, I quickly thought it was reality. I was scared to death in forgetting it was my story. 
When the death and destruction of the movie was finally over, I saw myself walking out of the theater where it had been playing. The lobby was completely empty and dark. As I went out the door toward my car, I saw the lobby lights behind me come on. I turned around and there was the whole cast. Every single dead actor was there laughing and smiling and cheering, just joyful that the movie was over. And there I was meeting the actors I had made up, directed and had violently killed off in my imaginary story. As I went back into the theater, I was happily and tearfully hugging every actor as if it was a family reunion. I was connected to them as if they were parts of me. A happy ending to a horrible dream I believe to be reality. Thank you. There it is. That's literally the story of the ego. I made it, we, we made a story based on guilt and kill or be killed, beliefs and separation, and then we created all these characters to be the bad guys that I kill off so that I can exist to be okay. And I'm in absolute pain and terror as I continue to reinforce that thought system until we wake up to that realization that I don't want that any longer. Very powerful. Can you, I mean, like the Course talks about the most holy place in the world is when an ancient hate get, becomes healed. Well, I can't heal me. I can't heal that relationship. I can drop the relationship so that I can recognize a different way of seeing that relationship through the eyes of love. But Mary Ann can't figure that out in the separated state. She had to get in her car and turn around and find out the answer was there all the time. Thank you, Rose. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. That was very powerful for me, too. Yeah, we could tell. <laughs> all right, just a couple more lines and we will close for the day. It is the hope that really ends up being a certainty. It is the hope that tells us no matter what is going on, there is always a light at the end of the tunnel. There is always a light that shines in darkness. And it is this light that is the true meaning of Christmas. And again, the sign of Christmas is a star, a light in darkness. See it not outside yourself, but yours, excuse me, but shining in the heaven within and accept it as the sign of the time of Christ has come. You understand that when you're aligned with this, you become you literally become that light, much like the lighthouse. It's it's totally impersonal. It just shines the light. And those who are ready to see the light will find the light. And and of course the opposite rings true here. When you align with the ego, it can't it can't not be darkness. Because you're living in a thought system a storyline that's based on kill or be killed. All the characters are playing out that storyline, including yourself. And we don't often add ourselves sometimes to that story because it appears to be outside of us. But we're the writers, not here as Mary Ann, but here as the, the, um, the writer and the director of the story. And then it gets played out and we jump in as one of the characters. Then we identify with a character of course, the sweet and innocent and victim, innocent victim one. And then we hate and want to kill the one that's the bad guy. And that's why it's so valuable and so important to do our best to, there's only one guy here. I'm either identified with the character in the dream that I identify as Mary Ann, or I'm the observer of the character of this insane dream where people kill each other and some of them die and it's not a very pretty picture. And in the end, whether you're a nice guy or a bad guy, we're going to die. Okay, that's a no-brainer in this thought system. And as we begin to observe the insanity of this storyline, that will not, it will never be a win-win story because it, it's not set up to be a win-win story. When we begin to understand that's what we have chosen and we stop judging or attacking the character 
Mary Ann the puppet in the play and identifying with her, we then begin to observe the play without judgment or attack, and then it dissipates and eventually falls away and allows the true nature of who we all are to begin to shine in that ultimate light that we all are. As they say, that's all, folks. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to do what I normally do, mute everybody, and we'll say the closing prayer, and then I'll unmute everybody, and if anybody wants to stay on, they're welcome to stay on at the end. So I invite everybody to close your eyes, take a nice big deep breath. <sighs> Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you in which there are no illusions and where none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? The sleep of forgetfulness is only the unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation, for the temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given, and accept but this, into the minds which you created and which you love. Amen. And just a, a real quick side comment. We will have class every week. We're not going to miss any classes because of the holiday. Come if you can. If you can't, I you all happy holidays and for the rest of you I hope to see you next week. Be well. <laughs>